Um, all right, so uh, what we're going to do, is that still working or, yeah, okay. What, what we're going to do is talk um, in more detail about character reconstruction and in particular using character reconstruction to do what's called phylogenetic inference, which is figuring out what the best phylogenetic tree is for a particular set of data. Um, in the previous lecture, is there still some feedback for people or is it okay? Uh, there shouldn't be another mic anywhere, so. Yeah, I turned it pretty far down, so. Um, so in the previous lecture, we talked about characters, different features of characters, and then tracing the history of characters, either if we know the history, just what that looks like on a phylogenetic tree, and what the different types of characters are, like um, different features of characters, and then different character states, tracing them on a tree. And what we're going to do today is go sort of the next two steps, which is using character state reconstruction to infer phylogeny. And we're going to continue with this in the next lecture, too. So the next, these two lectures are really about phylogenetic tree inference. And I went through this at the end of the last lecture. I'm just going to quickly go through it again because prep you for um, the rest of today, which is this issue of character state reconstruction. And so starting off, we assume we know what the phylogenetic tree looks like. That is the branching order in the tree. And we know character states for the taxa at the tips of the tree. But we don't know what the ancestral character states are for any of the ancestors of the organisms that we're looking at. And in particular, what people usually focus on is trying to identify what the character states are for the nodes, the ancestral nodes in the tree. So we have this example. We already went through this, but I'm going to go through it again with flight and bats and birds. And the character is flight, and it's basically the character state is presence or absence of flight. We're going to assume we know nothing about the history of that character over time. And so we try and figure out what is the most plausible pattern for the character states in the history of this group of organisms. We take the character states we observe, which is presence and absence, and we say, in theory, any of the nodes in the tree, the character state could be present or absent. That's why I've drawn you know, a, a present or absent figure here for each of the nodes in the tree. And then what we do is we consider all the possible patterns for present or absent at every possible node in the tree, and we test which ones of those are the best. So I gave you these examples of three possible patterns. Here's one, here's another, here's another. And what we're going to do is compare these three possible patterns and test which one is the best of those three possible patterns. There are many others that I'm not going to cover. So you can compare them side by side or however you want to do it. But the key thing that we're going to do is use this principle of parsimony and go through the tree and apply this principle of parsimony to character state reconstruction. And again, the key thing here is that you choose, if you have multiple possible options to choose from, you choose the one that is the simplest. That is the principle of parsimony. And as we apply this to character state reconstruction, we compare different possible patterns of ancestral character states, and we choose the one that requires the fewest number of changes in character state over time. We also call those changes steps. So we look for the pattern that requires the fewest steps over evolutionary time. So we're taking this principle, which could be applied to anything, and we're applying it to character state reconstruction. So we take these three patterns, and we ask for each of them how many state changes are required to have that pattern occur. So here's the first pattern. How many state changes are required? We look at each node, and we look, in essence, at each branch that connects a node in the tree. And we ask, has the character state changed between the two nodes? If no, then we say that we don't require any state changes to occur on that branch. 
If yes, we require a change in state to occur somewhere on that branch. We're not hypothesizing where on that branch, but just somewhere on that branch. And we represent that by these tick marks. That's how we represent that we are requiring a change to have occurred on these branches. So for this first pattern, it requires seven steps. Again, I mentioned this before, but I'm just going to do it again. We are not going to hypothesize more complicated scenarios, even though they could occur. So for example, it could have been that the node here had the pattern can't fly, and the node here had the pattern can't fly, and that during the evolution on this branch, the organisms that are represented on that branch went from can't fly to fly, and then back again to can't fly. That's more complicated than is required by the parsimony method. We're not saying that that didn't occur. It does happen in some cases. But if you don't have any evidence for it, you choose the simplest of the possibilities. That's what the parsimony method is about. So for pattern two, it requires two steps. And pattern three, it requires six steps. And now we should do this for every possible pattern. I'm only showing it to you for these three patterns. We then compare them to each other. And the pattern that is the best pattern for the ancestral character states for this character, for this tree, is the one with the fewest steps. And that's pattern two. Does that make sense what we've done here? Are there any questions about this? Yeah. Can you explain why the fewest steps is why the one that's considered most accurate? I didn't say it's the one that's considered most accurate. The principle of parsimony is that we are going to choose the simplest explanation. So since it is possible to come up with a pattern that requires only two evolutionary change events, that is considered simpler than a pattern that requires seven evolutionary change events. We're not saying we know that the simpler pattern is what occurred. But if you don't have any other evidence, this method, this approach to finding ancestral character state patterns requires us to pick the simplest. And it's called the parsimony method. It is not the only method that people use. There are other methods that might allow for more variance in the pattern. We will get to that on Friday, just briefly. The one we're going to focus on for this whole course is this parsimony method because it's the most straightforward. It, it is used reasonably broadly. It's got some imperfections, but that's what gets you to think about characters and ancestral character states and derived character states. Even though, in many cases, the simplest pattern is not, in fact, whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other? Someone said, yeah, I don't see a hand, so, OK. So this, if we go back to the tree this, that wins here, the reconstruction that wins, this two character state changes basically tells us that in these two different lineages, separately they evolved flight. That similarity between these organisms, their ability to fly, that similarity that arose separately in different branches is called homoplasy. And we will use that term throughout the course. So you have to understand when someone says something is homoplasis or there's homoplasy, that means that in two different lineages, the organisms became similar to each other separately. And that is in contrast to homology, which is similarity that is due to inheritance from a common ancestor. So you have to understand these two different things. Homoplasy, similarity, that arises separately in different branches. <coughs> Homology is similarity that is due to common ancestry. Okay. So what we're going to do now is take this concept of inferring ancestral character states for ancestral nodes and apply it to a more complicated situation, which is trying to determine what is the best branching pattern for the tree. So we're not given a tree. We actually now have to figure out what the tree is. So consider this situation. 
Imagine if we have these taxa and there's no knowledge about their phylogenetic relatedness. We could draw the information that we have for them here, that's in essence saying we know nothing, but you can draw it as a polytomy like this. This is the case for many organisms. Um, people have been arguing about, for example, insect evolution for a long time. There's actually some resolution here now, but in many cases, when people want to study insect evolution, they might take a new data set and start from scratch and just assume that we know nothing about the relationships among the organisms and then try and infer what those relationships are. We're going to focus on the simplest possible situation that we can do to go through the methodology here, and that involves four taxa. We're going to use the primates, since you might at least be familiar with the organisms here more than some of the others that we could do. We're going to try and infer the relationships among these organisms, but we're going to, this is a hypothetical situation, so throw away everything you know about um, the relationships among chimps, humans, gorillas, and orangutans. Those are the taxa that I'm just going to use here so that it's easy to talk about it. So there's one complicated thing about what we're going to do for the next two days that you're going to have to wrap your brains around, and that is we are no longer going to use, or we're not going to focus on using these trees where there's a root branch and a root node in the tree. We are going to use what are called unrooted trees. And there are many reasons why we are going to end up using unrooted trees. I've listed some of these here. I'm going to come back to this later, so you don't really need to worry about this now. But when, whenever we introduce unrooted trees, many people wonder why, why are we doing this complicated thing. Um, and so in particular, for our purposes here, the main reason that we're going to use unrooted trees is that, in fact, doing the analysis is a lot easier when we use unrooted trees, and you will see why in a couple of minutes. That just repeats what I just said. It's called an unrooted tree. So I'm going to show you what we mean by unrooted trees here by comparing an unrooted tree to a rooted tree when they have sort of the same phylogenetic patterns in them. So here's what an unrooted tree can look like for four taxa, A, B, C, and D here. In unrooted trees, there is no known time axis. The unrooted tree is just showing branching patterns. And we do not yet know until you root a tree which direction really time is progressing on this tree. And you'll see this in a minute. So what I'm going to do is take you through two ways to think about unrooted trees. I'm going to start with this tree here, a rooted tree for A, B, C, and D. And if we throw away the root of this tree and make it an unrooted tree, it becomes this tree over here. So I'm going to show you how we do that. So we take the rooted tree and we throw away the root or the root branch from the tree. Just get rid of it. We're saying we know nothing about the root in this tree. We throw away the root node in the tree as well. And then this sort of crook in the tree where we had the root node, you could leave it like this and tell people to ignore this and say there's no node there. But it's simpler to rotate the branches and just show this as a single line connecting these two points. So I'm going to draw a single line and then rotate the branches around. And this is the unrooted version of that tree that I started out with. So it's now become identical to this tree that I showed over here. Are there any questions about this before what I just did there? I know sort of in terms of evolution, this may not make complete sense yet or maybe ever, but you're going to have to wrap your brains around the sort of what we're the construct that we're doing here with unrooted trees. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit more information about rooting trees and unrooted trees. So one thing that might help you think about unrooted trees and rooted trees is to take an unrooted tree and then root it. Figure out where, where draw different possible root branches and root nodes into this tree and then redraw the tree as your standard either vertical or horizontal tree that we're used to seeing. 
So here's that same tree, type of tree, this unrooted tree with four taxa. We can draw a root into this tree as I've drawn here. So here's a root branch, and then the root node would be right here, which I didn't highlight, but this root node here. And then we can now convert this tree into a drawing that shows a vertical tree for this particular unrooted tree now rooted at this particular point. It becomes this tree here. And to see this, what you do is you, here's the root branch. It corresponds to this branch here. And then just trace each node to the left of the, well, to either side of the node, because remember nodes can spin around. They can spin around in unrooted trees, just like in rooted trees. So to one side, there's a branch that goes to a node that then joins A and B. So here on one side is a branch that goes to a node that joins A and B. On the other side is a branch that goes to a node that joins C and D. On the other side is a branch that goes to a node that joins C and D. That's how we root an unrooted tree and convert it into a vertical tree. We can do the same thing by rooting this in another place. So we can take that unrooted tree and now say, let's root, draw the root into this branch here. So the root branch is here, the root node is there. Let's untangle that. Here's the root branch. On one side of the root node is a branch just leading up to B on its own. On one side is a branch leading up to B. On the other side is a branch leading up to a node that links together all of A, B, and C. That's what is right here. The next branching, one of the branches goes to A on its own. Here's the branch going to A on its own. And another branch goes to a node that joins C and D. So these trees are what are called topologically identical. We've just drawn it now to show you the standard view of a vertical tree. There is no way you can rotate the branches around, but these trees mean the same thing once you draw the root into it. So again, let's do it again. Here's the root branch going into here, and untangling it looks like this. So you have to be able to do this. We will be using unrooted trees for some of the course, and you're going to have to be able to think about, if I draw a root going into here, what is that going to do when I untangle the tree? And it affects the meaning. Where you put the root branch into this tree affects what this tree means. So if I put the root branch here into the middle, it creates two monophyletic groups, one with A and B and one with C and D. But if I put the root branch here, we now have a tree that has a different meaning. There still is the monophyletic group of C and D, but now A, C, and D represent a monophyletic group to the exclusion of B. So drawing the root into this part of the tree creates a different meaning than drawing the root into this part of the tree. Any questions about this? Okay. So let's, uh, this is the last practice for the clickers. We think we have the system working pretty well. So on Friday, we will actually use them for either bonus points or if you get an email message, possibly for a little quiz. So the question is, how many possible rootings are there for an unrooted tree with four taxa, just like we've shown here? And the rootings, in essence, like I showed you a minute ago. And again, for clicker questions, you're welcome to talk to your neighbors and try and come to a consensus. If they get it wrong, you can punish them later. All right, just a couple more seconds. 
Even if you don't know the answer, please send in an answer because we're going to check to make sure we get your student ID correctly and we will send people messages if we're not. Um, we will try and make sure this works before counting on Friday. Okay, so we're going to stop. Woohoo! All right, so most people got it correct. The correct answer is five. And it's basically drawing a root branch into any of these branches along the tree. In theory, you could actually draw a root into one of the nodes. We are going to not allow that for this course, basically. <laughs> it, it creates polytomies. It's something that is not normally done when we're doing this type of evolutionary reconstruction. So we're going to, in essence, ignore that possibility of drawing a root into the node and instead say that the only possible ways to root one of these trees is to draw the root branch into one of the other branches. So you can count, in essence, the number of branches in a tree. That will tell you the number of rootings possible for that tree, for that unrooted tree. Okay, so here, we're not gonna do this as a clicker question, but here's a thought question. How many possible ways can you draw one of these unrooted trees like this? for four taxa. So this is one possible way for four taxa as I've shown here. How many other distinct ways can you draw this tree, that is change the species at the tips with the same structure of the topology but move around the species? How many different ways can you do this with four taxa? Yeah, question. No. Oh, you want to answer it. Just give people a second to think about it and I will call on you. <laughs> um, all right, so how many do you think it is? Uh, three. Three. Um, you want to explain how you figured that out? Um, in one, like this is one. Um, yeah. So in the other one, you just rotate like C and A, um, and then C and D. Right, so, so the way I think about it is similar, but what I do is just say, let's just focus on the left half here. A can be with B, A can be with C, or A can be with D. And, and that forces you to figure out what is for the other two. And remember, you can rotate any node. So putting D on the top here and C on the bottom is the same tree because that node can just pivot around. The only way to get different trees is to switch which side of this branch things are on. So you should draw these down and make sure you understand that there are only three possible ways. Yeah. So the, the order is always determined by this tree. So if I go back to here, I drew the root into here, and then I took this exact tree and un, unwrapped it in essence. So here's the root branch, and then there are branches on each side. It doesn't matter. I could have, I could have flipped this whole thing over to the other side. It means the same thing. Is that what you were asking? So... I could have put B on its own over on this side and had A, C, and D on the left. I could rotate this node, but, but that doesn't change the meaning. So you have to be able to do that in your head for every one of these trees. You have to realize that what matters is the groupings in the tree, not which side things are on left and right. Okay? Any other questions about that? So here are the three trees, just for people to see them. A and B over here, A and C over here, and A and D. And again, that forces whatever is going to happen on the other side. So for four taxa, there are only three possible unrooted trees. Okay, so now um, try and think about this. This is a more complex problem, and again, not going to do clickers here, but just think about it. How many different rooted trees are there possible for four taxa? You can talk to your neighbors or...
Well, I didn't. I didn't open up the. Please. I mean, I, we could have done it as a clicker, but I didn't do it as a clicker question. Would you like to? It, I mean, it's not going to count for points. All right. We're, I'm going to launch the clicker just because you asked, because it'll be really exciting. Um, <laughs> Is that good? Just because you really wanted to. All right, so while people put in the answer there, just to make it rewarding to answer these questions, um, would you like to explain your answer? Uh, all right, I'm going to stop it here. It's not going to count, so don't freak out. The correct answer is D. Would you like to explain your answer? Yeah, sure. So um, I think we said there was uh, five ways to root each of three trees. So I just multiply them together. Exactly. So we took one tree, and there were five different ways to root that one tree. And then we have three possible unrooted trees, so it's just 3 times 15. So this is all of them. These are the 15 different rooted trees for four taxa. And one of the reasons we focus on unrooted trees for what we're going to do for the rest of today and on Friday is that if we wanted to study the evolution of four taxa, we would have to compare 15 different rooted trees and score them in some way. And instead, we're going to compare just three unrooted trees and score them and pick the winner. In the end, you get basically the same result, but it's easier to do it with just three unrooted trees as opposed to 15 rooted trees. So again, here are the three unrooted trees. We're going to throw away A, B, C, and D to give you, you know, organisms here that I mentioned before with the chimp, gorilla, human, and orangutan. So again, if you look at this in terms of organisms, tree one has chimp, and orangutan together, sharing a node here. Tree two has gorilla and orangutan. Tree three has human and orangutan. All right, so now what we're going to do is take these trees and try and compare them and score them and pick, given a data set, which one is better than the other ones. And this is, we're also going to use this parsimony method, but now it's going to be parsimony phylogenetic tree reconstruction rather than just parsimony character state reconstruction. So we're going to figure out which tree is the best using a very comparable approach to what we did just for characters before. So before doing this, I want to talk a little bit about the concept and the principle here. The principle is very straightforward. As organisms evolve, as you have one species, one population, and then it splits into two descendant lineages, and then those split, and those split, those taxa accumulate changes over time. They may be changes that don't affect the appearance of the organisms very much or at all. They may be changes that do affect them, like in the bunny video, in some way. Or major changes can occur as well. But over time, organisms accumulate differences, and the more closely related organisms are, that is, the more recently they share a common ancestor with each other, the fewer differences they should have. So if two organisms are separated by more nodes on the tree, they should have more differences from each other than two organisms that are separated by fewer nodes. Now, this doesn't always work out perfectly. We can have unrelated organisms that become similar to each other, like with flight, in different branches. So in fact, what you want to do for phylogenetic reconstruction is try and find characters that are less prone to homoplasy than others. So I'll just give you an example of this. You might not want to use height as your character to study animal evolution. That's probably not as robust and changes pretty rapidly over evolutionary time and you have unrelated organisms becoming similar in height as opposed to using bone structure. 
So you want to think about what characters you're going to use and try and avoid those that might be particularly prone to this issue of homoplasy when you try and build an evolutionary tree. Parsimony reconstruction methods are just one of the many methods you could use to take this concept, that is, closely related organisms should be more similar to each other, and build a tree. That's what we're going to focus on for the next one and a half lectures. But we will mention a few other methods for inferring phylogenetic trees after that. So we're going to take you through the parsimony method, but there are other methods out there. So again, going back to this character state reconstruction, we applied the principle of parsimony to finding which character state pattern was the best by identifying the one that required the fewest changes over time, given a tree. And now what we're going to do is apply the same thing but across multiple trees and multiple characters. So basically what we're going to do is take whatever taxa we're interested in, Compare all possible trees that could relate those taxa. And then, for all those possible trees, we're going to go through each character that we're studying and identify the fewest changes required for that character given that tree. And then we're going to sum up for each tree across all characters that score, that fewest possible changes for character one, fewest possible changes for character two, fewest possible changes for character three, and then we're going to do that for tree two and tree three, and if we were doing more, we would do tree four and tree five. We're selecting this simple example of four taxa and the unrooted tree because it's just going to be much easier. In reality, we do this for hundreds to thousands of taxa with computers, but we're going to go through the exercise with just these four taxa and a few characters. I'm going to skip over this and I'll come back to this. In the lab, you are using a slightly different approach to try and test phylogenetic trees. You are using rooted trees and some information about the outgroup and the character state in the outgroup to infer things about the, the pattern in the tree. This unrooted approach is distinct from what you are doing in the lab. So we wanted to cover both of them. One is covered in the lab. One is covered in the lecture. So this is basically what I just outlined before. The procedure that we're going to do is draw all the possible trees. And for each character, count the minimum number of steps required for each tree. And we're going to then sum up across all characters for each tree. And the winner is called the most parsimonious tree. And that's the one with the lowest score. That is, the fewest character state changes required to match the data to that tree. So there are lots of characters you could use for whatever taxa that you're interested in. We've shown a few examples here. So you could use flight or presence of wings as your character, and the character states could be present or absent. You could use eye color or leg length, any of these things. What we're going to focus a lot of attention on is DNA data as they did in the video because we can generate lots of it and it turns out to be very useful for phylogenetic reconstruction but in theory and in practice you could use any type of data again you want to use data that's probably you know less prone to homoplasy but you want to use any type of data we usually codify this data when we're analyzing it so when you do this it makes it easier to compare taxa when you convert absent to zero and present to one for example and for DNA, we're just going to use A, C, T, and G. Um, so here's an example of data for these four groups of organisms. This is what's called a data matrix. A data matrix has, in essence, the taxa that you're studying in rows, the characters that you have measured for those taxa in columns, and the character state for each individual taxon is the entry into the matrix. So here's character one for these four taxa, character two for these four taxa, character three, et cetera. And it can again be codified in all sorts of different ways and you can mix together data from all sorts of different types of characters into one data matrix and then use it 
in the way we're going to infer phylogeny in a minute or two. So this is really important. We're going to show you lots of data matrices throughout the course, so you should understand what they represent. We're going to focus for the phylogenetic reconstruction on DNA data. It's just to be consistent mostly and because people are moving more and more towards using DNA data um, in their evolutionary studies. So here's a hypothetical, completely made up example of data from these four taxa. So DNA data across nine characters. DNA comes in four states, C, A, T, G. And this is the character state for each of the taxa. So what we're going to do is now figure out which tree of those three unrooted trees for these four taxa is the winning tree for all of this data. So let's start. We have tree 1, tree 2, and tree 3. So we need to now map character 1 onto tree 1. That's our first task. And then go through all the characters on all the trees. So here's character 1. Orangutan C, Chimp C, Gorilla C, Humans T. I've mapped it onto the trees here. Here are the three trees. I've thrown away the taxon name because it's not relevant to our figuring out what the ancestral character state pattern was for each of these, um, each of these trees. But if you want to see how I did that, I'll just show you in a little more detail. You start out with, I just threw away the taxa. I have the tree that it maps to here. Here's the data. Orangutan is C, so let's add a C to the position where orangutan is in each of these trees. Let's add a C to the position where chimp is in each of the trees, a C to the position where gorilla is, and a T to the position where humans is. For our purposes from now on, we're going to kind of ignore the taxa when we're trying to figure this out because it doesn't matter what the name of the organism is once we have the character data. So let's zoom in now on character one on tree one. We have to ask the question, what is the minimum number of character state changes required to generate this data for this tree? So to do that, we do the analogous thing to what we did with flight, but it's now on an unrooted tree. Fortunately, it's still simple. What you have to do is now figure out character states for the nodes, just like we did in the rooted tree for flight. We have to hypothesize all possible character states for these two nodes. So we have two character states, C and T, that are represented at the tips here. The parsimony method tells us that we're not going to hypothesize any of the ancestral states are A and G, because that's going to create way too many changes. We're going to hypothesize that this node here and this node here are constrained and have to be either C or T. With two nodes and two character states, there are four possible patterns for those nodes to take. So again, just like we did with the rooted trees, but we're going to do it with this unrooted tree. Here are the four possible patterns. C at this node and C at this node. T and C. C and T, and then T and T. So now for these four possible ancestral character state patterns, we have to figure out which one requires the fewest number of evolutionary change events. So let's take this one first. How many evolutionary change events are required for this data given this tree? One. You have a change from C to T on this branch. So that's one step or one change. And we go through tree two. How many are required for this one? Two. Two steps. This one's a mess. Four steps. Three steps. Again, you just look for the nodes. And if there's a difference in character state between any of the nodes, you have to draw a tick mark and hypothesize a change. So now we want to know which one is the best. That's the one requiring the fewest changes. So it's painstaking, it's agonizing, but you have to do this exercise for each character for each tree. 
So now for character one on tree one, the score we give it is one. That's the minimum number of changes required for that character on that tree. So we give that a score of one, and now we move on to character one on tree two. Really fun, I know, but you gotta learn how to do this. Um, so there's character one mapped onto tree two. We do the same exercise. There are four possible ancestral character state patterns. For the first pattern, the number of changes is one. For the second pattern, the number of changes is two. Four, three. The winner is one again. You only require one change for this character on that tree. And we go on to tree three. Now you may have figured out the pattern here. I'm gonna show you it anyway, but it turns out if you have everything is the same except for one of your taxa, then the minimum number of changes is gonna be one for that character. All trees are gonna be the same. They're each going to get the same score, but I'm just going to show it to you anyway. Here's character one for tree three. Oh, I didn't. I deleted it because they're all the same. Um, so character one for tree three, you get the same pattern. Anytime you have a single character state in one of your taxa and everything else is a different character state but identical to each other, the minimum number of changes is going to be one. And that's a trick that you should use when we ask you on a test for figuring out which trees are the best trees. Um, so now we sum up for character one. Here's the score. Tree one gets a score of one. Tree two gets a score of one. Tree three gets a score of one. And we now move on to character two. So here's character two. Everything is a T. Can anyone guess what the minimum number of character state changes are going to be for tree one and tree two? And tree three? Right, so all the trees are equal because we don't need to hypothesize any changes if every taxon, if all of them have the same character state. Again, there could have been character state changes in the past, but the parsimony character state reconstruction method says we're not going to add any complexity here. So there's what the character for character two now, each tree gets a score of zero. And then for character three, it's the Lady Gaga character, um, we're going to have, that, that probably was on purpose in my head, but um, uh, we're going to go through the same exercise again. So again, I've put the character states on the tip of the tree. We're going to go to tree one and now test all the possible ancestral character state reconstructions. There are only two character states. This time they're G and A instead of C and T. So we have to hypothesize the ancestral character states are either G or A. There are four possible patterns again. A, 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 G, G, A, and G, G. And now we do the same exercise now how many character state changes are required for this one? Two. How about this one? Right, so three. One, two, three. This one? Three. And this one? Two. So now we have a tie. Which one is right? Anybody know which one is correct? They're both correct. So parsimony tells us to choose the simplest of options, but if two things come up with the same score, we can't pick between them. There is no other information that I've presented that would allow us to distinguish which of these is best. But I didn't tell you to figure out which one was best. I just told you to figure out what the minimum score was. It doesn't matter which one is best. We know that the minimum score is going to be two because they're both two. So you don't have to know which one is the winner for this particular activity. You just have to know which, what is the minimum number of changes required for this character on that tree. 
Does that make sense? Any questions about this so far? Okay, so now we do it again. I've just drawn on here the two possible patterns. They're each, you know, come up to two changes, so the sum is two. And now we go to tree two. So character three on tree two. Again, ancestral character states are either G or A. We now go through the exercise. Two steps for that one. Five steps for that one. One step for that one. Two steps for that one. So what's the winner? One. So for this character on tree number two, we have a difference now in the minimum number of changes compared to tree number one. We go to tree number three. Oh, uh, yeah, I have to up re-upload a new PDF. I just made a, a couple of typos in this slide on the <coughs> PDF uh, that, that's out there um, that I already uploaded. Uh, so you test all possible ancestral character state patterns for character three on tree three. And the minimum is two. So two wins again. We don't care which one wins but the score is two, and now we have a difference. So far we've gone through three characters, and for character one, there was no difference between the trees. For character two, there was no difference between the trees. For character three, however, there is a difference between the trees. One of the trees scores a little bit better than the other two trees. So now we continue to march our way through the data. Character four, zero, 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 because everything is identical, and so on. We do the rest of the characters, zero, zero, zero. Character five, one, 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 exactly. So um, character six, it has the same general pattern as character three. Orangutan and gorilla are the same, and chimp and human are the same. So in fact, once you recognize that, you don't even have to do the character state reconstruction again. You know that the score has to be the same as for character three. Because you could just swap out C and T for G and A. Character seven now is different. Gorilla and human are together, orangutan and chimp are together. You should try this exercise and figure out that tree one gets one Tree two gets two, and tree three gets two. That's zero, 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 one, one, one. And so in the end, there is a tree that wins. It's tree number two. And in the next lecture, we'll talk more about this and then talk about other issues with phylogenetic tree inference.